Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. I see Vicky's out there. Good morning. Hi, Vicky. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Stephanie and Hannah and Debbie. This is like romper room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Love that. <laughs> um, if you would put in your in the chat today where you're joining us from, that would be lovely. I'm here in Seattle today. So am I. Oh, from Maine. Lovely. Way upstate. San Francisco, Canton, New York. Way upstate. I love that. Burlington, Winthrop. I hope the smoke isn't bad in Winthrop anymore. We've been watching that very carefully over there. Yeah. So the we'll start in just a moment. Carol is joining us from Central Ohio. Welcome. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joni Parsons, co-creator of Rebel 11, along with Monica Smith. Monica, say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, we created Rebel 11 to have informative, educational, edgy, and fun events and retreats for women around the globe. I'm so proud to say that we have more than 5,000 women from across the world uh, as a part of our community. So thank you for being here today. So we'll be talking about friendships and friendships are the most incredible thing, aren't they? It really is one of the best things in life. And I wanted to talk about a little bit about creativity and, you know, Monica and I are best friends and we created Rebel 11 together. And it really would not be the same without the creativity of both of our minds working together to make Rebel 11 the best it can be. And I'm so grateful, Monica, for our friendship and what we've been able to create together. Same here. Thank you. <laughs> Truly, it's been an amazing journey, which brings me to today. We have two incredible award-winning writers here to talk about their new poetry books. In fact, they will come out, the books will come out on the same, at the same time with the same publisher. And I'm so honored to introduce Anna Maria, whom I've known for 30 plus years, and also Sarah. So welcome today to Revel 11 today, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. such a treat to be here. Um, I'm so thrilled that you're joining us and honored that you'll be talking about your books today. Anna Maria, will you tell us a little bit about you and then we'll go to Sarah. Sure, I grew up um, in Riverside, California, a suburb of Los Angeles and um, moved to Oregon for college because I wanted to see rivers and mountains and trees. And um, that eventually took me to my home in Stahican, Washington where I met Lori and um, and we built a cabin and I can't even call it a dream life because I could not have dreamed something so magical. And then in my late thirties, I'd been writing all this time and I had a book come out and I was be able, able to start this life of, of writing and teaching. It took me to, to Whidbey Island and to Los Angeles where I knew Sarah. It took me to Tallahassee, Florida and now to upstate New York. Um, and so it's been a, yet another unimaginable amazing life. So I'm so happy to share that with everyone. Thanks, Anna Maria. How about you, Sarah? Well, uh, it's interesting. I just thought of a parallel with Anna Maria, who I've been friends with for years and never noticed this before, but I grew up in New Jersey and then went to Vermont because I needed to be around the rivers and the mountains and, and all of that. Um, but I have been, I got in my MFA in poetry. And then after that, I kind of by mistake, I started writing fiction and then I kept writing fiction and teaching fiction and specializing in fiction. Um, but all along I was writing poetry, kind of secretly writing poetry. So uh, that that kind of brings me up to today, I think. And um, Anna Maria, do you wanna share a story about when the two of you first met? I sure do. Um, <laughs> 
I was working, I was working at a, um, a master of fine arts and creative writing program on Whitby Island. And I'd been working there a few years. We were going to have a new faculty member. It's going to be Sarah. We've never met Sarah. She comes on the shuttle from SeaTac to Coopville. And we're super excited to meet her. Other friends are there. We grab her bag. We go to Captain Whitby Inn and we get there and we realize it's not her bag. She got the wrong bag. This is, I mean, she's there for 10 days from New York and she's got the wrong bag. And I have to say, if that were me, I would have been a little disgruntled. But here is Sarah with all the grace in the world. She sort of said, well, what can you do? I'm going to call the, I'm going to call the shuttle company. I'm going to go to Walmart and get underwear. And then we're going to do this writing adventure that we're here for. And right away, I thought, oh my goodness, if I could have half the grace of this individual, uh -huh. I want to be friends with her. So um, that was where it started. I think Sarah can pick it up from there. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, gosh. No, I, I was completely freaked out. I was so excited to be there. I just felt like I had finally gotten the job that I really wanted in teaching. And, and actually, as I remember it, I was completely freaked out that I had no, I had the clothes I had worn on the plane and that was it. And, and I like, I, I think a lot about how I look and my clothing. And so, so it just seemed like a, a, an ironic twist of fate. But I remember that what I did was I asked Anna Maria, can I borrow your car to go to Walmart? <laughs> like three days in a row because each day I'm going to forget something that I need and that Anna Maria was so gracious and generous and just threw me the keys and said take the car and I knew then that th this was going to last. So let's talk about a little bit about the power of friendship. It's so important and how has yours blossomed over the years? We have been we have kind of moved all over the place geographically, which was totally unexpected. Um, our program changed and shifted. We ended up in Los Angeles. So here we are, friends who met on lovely Whitby, Whitby Island, and then we're in Culver City together. You know, so we have to make this big transition. And you know, you never know how a friendship is going to survive something like that. Like how someone mm -hmm. is in, in one setting as opposed to another is totally different. So we we, we came through that growth together. And then we ended up, um, I ended up here in New York, which is where Sarah is. And so now we're like reconfiguring the friendship again, uh, mid pandemic in the Adirondacks. And I, I just feel like <laughs> wow. every time we're in this new, we're thrown into a new situation, I always feel this, oh, but it's Sarah, everything's okay, right? No matter oh. where we are, it's Sarah and, and we can make it work. Yeah, yeah, I, I just love this. Um the parallel lives that we're living, that first where it would be, and then as a testament to our fine teaching skills or to complete sheer luck, we both got transferred to the Antioch LA MFA, low residency MFA program at the same moment. And so we did that together and we would go swim, we went swimming in the ocean, I think that first residency and we're splashing around and Anna Maria says, we got in the lifeboat again, we got in the lifeboat. <laughs> and that's how it's felt. Like our, at one point we each had a book coming out at the same time and we read together. And, and then when this came up, uh, both of our poetry books getting accepted in the same week by the same press, it just felt like, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is my life now is side by side with Anna Maria and how great. Oh, that I just love that story so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. So each of you are award-winning writers. Sarah, you have fiction, and Anna Maria, you have nonfiction. Why poetry? I mean, Sarah, you already talked a little bit about you studied poetry in school, but tell us a little bit more about your journey towards poetry. Um, well, it goes back pretty far. It goes back to my mother had studied poetry at Bennington with Theodore Rutke. And she carried that through her life, her love of poetry. And she would recite poetry to us when we were kids, mm -hmm. sometimes inappropriately dark poetry, but <laughs> beautiful, like Hopkins, you know, real poetry. So I feel like I kind of got it in my blood. And then um, I was working as a newspaper reporter and I was in my late 20s, I was about 30. And uh, I just decided I have to, I cannot be a newspaper reporter. I have to be a poet. And I got my degree in poetry. But then, as I said, I kind of veered off into fiction and not really knowing what I was doing. 
and but then my first novel got published my second novel got published and but I continued to write poetry all along and so uh this collection that I have is is some new new work and some older poems that I had written you know over the past whatever 30 years Anna Maria yeah. My, in, in this case, our, our journeys are absolutely opposite. I had, I had never written poetry. I read poetry and admire it, but I had never written it. Um, but there's something about poetry, I, you know, that, um, that just dives to the heart of whatever you're trying to say. It gets to the emotional truth in, in such um, an intense and condensed way. And um, I started going there sort of to get to deeper places, get to new places. And then the pandemic hit and I noticed that my attention span, it seems like everyone's attention span grew shorter um, and that poetry was something that we could both create and digest more easily. It got to this deep thing that we were all feeling. I mean, I'm even, I'd even be going on Twitter, which is so famously, um, you know, difficult and people would be sharing the most beautiful poems. People I didn't even know read poetry. So it seems um, uh, of the moment, I feel like it's another um, serendipitous um, experience to have come to poetry in this particular time and to be sharing it in this particular time. So I'd love for each of you to share more about your book, but I wanted, I want Sarah to go first, but I want to read a quote um, about Sarah's poetry. Energy is one thing and emotion is another. Her poetry leaps, sliding through her memories, then twisting she comes back everything she has ever meant is both magical and filled with laughter sarah that's just such a beautiful acknowledgement of of what is to come in your book um taken can you tell us more about the book yeah yeah first i just want to acknowledge that that's written by eloise klein healy who i i first knew in graduate school back in the pleistocene era at Vermont College. And then she founded the Antioch program in which I now teach. So it's this really lovely connection and, and I'm just so grateful to her for, for that generous quote. Um, so the book, the title of the book is, is a, the title poem is called Taken and it's about an experience that I had as a teenager. Um, the, the, Book, when I think of the book as a whole, it's one part very personal poems, like the title poem. But in, in the book, I'm trying to expand my personal experience to a wider view of the world as it is right now and the, the conditions in which we all live right now. Uh, so I'm ho I hope that I've done that. I hope that I've woven the personal and the political and the global kind of in with, in with each other. Beautiful. Um, I'm so excited for you to read some, uh, a poem of yours in shortly. So we'll, um, we'll do that in a moment. Anna Maria, here's a quote about your book. Anna Maria's debut poetry collection quakes with the full magnitude and magnificence of life spin up close and personal with nature. That is such an accurate quote about you as, as I have known you for so many years, Anna Maria, and that's why I chose that quote to read today. Oh, thank you so much. It's, um, uh, it's an honor to, have, to hear those words, to have had have those written about the book. Um, it's called Mile Marker 6, and um, that is where we live. Our, our cabin in Stahican doesn't have actual addresses. There are no numbers on the houses. And so when you tell people where you live, you just say, well, I'm at Mile Marker 6. And so um, many of them are just, you know, right there in that place, literally. One's about building a rock wall on my knees and watching coyote puppies run by while I've got mortar all over my hands. Um, and, and, um, and yet when the book came out and I gave it to my friend, Jill McCabe Johnson, who wrote those lovely words, she said, oh, mile marker six, is that because you're entering your sixth decade of life? And I said, no, no, no. And then I thought about it and I thought, oh, it is because it's both those things. It's like looking at this small place where I live and much like Sarah's book, it's also looking at the larger world and how the world has shifted and how I have shifted over time. And it also kind of 
oscillates between the very personal and then um, the larger crises that we that we face it, from climate to um, injustice to um, you know all, all of the challenges that we're facing and that we have to face um, while looking at the beauty of nature. So I think yet again, it's one of the parallels between Sarah's beautiful work and my own is that that twofold trying to hold both those things, the wonder and the urgency at once. I want to talk a little bit more about that because in today's description, you wanted to discuss um, how we address climate urgency with the art of storytelling and as poets, how we can celebrate what is small, confront the difficult and nurture the creative values of wildness, collaboration and laughter. I'd love for you to both share what that means specifically to you. Because I think that that was, that's what drew me so much to this topic is that there is this urgency going on and how do we make this personal to ourselves and yet make change at the same time in small ways? I mean, just like you're saying that small, small bits is what's really um, resonating with all of us right now, but how can we do that in nature in our day-to-day -day lives as well? Huge, huge, huge question, isn't it? Yeah. But I think that, I think that it does. I, it always has to start with what's small and what you see and what you notice and what you can care about because it's that care and that nurture that builds the passion that, that generates out into the bigger world. Um, for me, I, I can't always start with the bigger world as much as I care about it. It's more than I can take. I think it's more than any of us can take. What I can take is coyote pups. And when I see the coyote pups leaping over down logs, then I can think, oh my goodness, I want for them, I want for everyone in the world to feel this wonder, I want for things to, um, to thrive. And, and, um, and I think that art can do that. I think poetry in particular can hold all of that without this awkward explanation like me trying to explain it here, that you just have those things together and, um, and make the larger problems of the world also part of your everyday life, which we're trying to do with this quote, with these poems, right? I think I see that in, in certainly in the poem of, of Sarah's that I'm going to read. But with that, I'm, I'll let you continue on, Sarah. What do you have? Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly what Anna Maria just said, that it's almost impossible to write about the big question as a big question, especially in poetry. And I think poems and and the fiction that tries to do that often fails because we live in a very small way. We just live our own little lives with our own little, with our, you know, one little glass of water. So I can't, it, it, it's True. almost impossible for me to write about the water crisis, the global water crisis, but I can write about this one little glass of water. And I think that's what, what poetry does is that it allows you to kind of um, fracture the, the big, big question into little small pieces that then can speak to the reader. That is a perfect analogy. Thank you for sharing that. It brings it down to what is real and what's right in front of us. What's right in front of us right here. Um, so I would love, Sarah, for you to read your favorite Anna Maria poem, and then we'll have Anna Maria do the same. Okay, well, I'm going to read a poem by Anna Maria called Eclipse. Don't look directly. Look through a pinhole or dark paper specks. Look at others not looking, but not too long. Don't stare at smooth skin mounded and sunk, whiskered maps to new eras. Even the sun goes blind, or maybe she doesn't know, still imagines herself photosynthesizing as saucers tip to spill time in the corner of a warped skillet or a leashed dog's eye. You could be in Madras for full dark or elsewhere on the right track, stoppered in road strewn thistle and wildfire as the moon second fiddle for so long steps up with giddy glory to scallop the sidewalk with self portraits. You've wrong tracked delightedly so long you're shocked by soft care 
now for the unsighted. <clears throat> nothing she's done wrong, nothing at all, just the moon, sly as a saddle sore, spinning sunlight into slivers. Wow, that wow. is so beautiful. <laughs> wow, Anna Maria, my breath is just taken away. Oh, yeah. thank you, thank yeah. you. I'm and Anna Maria, why don't you read one of your favorite Sarah poems? I am delighted to. This poem is called Tulip Heart. On your desk, a vase of tulips, yellow red. This curved and straight stemmed color cluster is the force of light and beauty against the gray, against the day's news coming with its urgency the expected vote in Washington. But the tulips insist, live and go on, even as they're dying too. And you know the morning paper still awaits, but have your coffee in your ceramic cup, the one your mother made, wheels spinning underneath her feet. There's blooming here, the lovely tulips, lovely line, green stems in the watery glass and ahead of you, the whole suffering day, the legislator's noise about to shatter the world. But this is the stuff of life. This is what it is to be awake. The way you survive is to carry your tulip heart into the whirlwind. Mm. Your tulip heart. I love that. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing one another's poems. I think that's so powerful. Um, Sarah, we had discussed a very special thing that we're going to do right now called the golden shovel. Would you please explain that? Yes, I would. Um, so the golden shovel is a form. And anybody who thinks that writing formal poetry means you're stuck with sonnets and, and uh, sestinas. Forms are continually being invented by poets. So Terence Hayes, a contemporary poet, invented a form called the golden shovel in which he took a line, he took a whole poem by Gwendolyn Brooks and used, reused some of the n-words for his n-words. Um, a simpler way of explaining what it is, is that you take a line of a poem that you admire, and from that one line, you use each word as the end word of each of your lines. So if there are seven words in the line that you like, your poem will have seven lines. And Hayes did this on a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks called We Real Cool that probably everyone knows. And um, I recommend everybody look up online, Hayes is the Golden Shovel, which is the title of his poem, and then look up the Gwendolyn Brooks poem. And it's, it's incredible and fantastic and just like, this guy is a genius. Uh, so Anna Maria and I were creating our dual promotion of our poetry books and we're poets, we're not self-promoters. So we came up with this really hokey idea that, okay, if you buy, a copy of both of our books. To, so to try to cross pollinate here, buy a copy of both of our books. We will send you a super secret surprise package to thank you. And then we had to think, oh, what's gonna be in that super secret surprise package? So we, we kind of came up with a few things. And one thing we came up with, possibly the best thing was that we would each write a golden shovel from one of each other's poems and include that along with instructions for writing a golden shovel in the super secret package. So I wrote a golden shovel based on the poem of hers that I just read Eclipse and she wrote a golden shovel based on Tulip Heart. And who would like to share that golden shovel today? I'll read mine. Okay, I think we have time for both if we wanna do that. So that would be great. It's called After Eclipse. It's a dark night and I'm crazed with it. Wildfire burning across the meadows as we watch the burning, the moon rising at last from the shadowy tree horizon, second in size only to my heart's scallop. And that was from the line of hers and wildfire as the moon second. 
terrific. Fantastic. I um, when I wrote after Tulip Heart, I did a couple of things. First of all, I I um, I as we do in poetry, I fooled with the rules and changed the rules of the golden shovel a little bit and took a word from each line. Um, but I also started with this idea of um, of a desk because that's how Sarah's poem starts. And it took me in a, in a whole other, other direction, but I loved how the constraint of using Sarah's language, like it just gave a huge new spark, I think, to my own language. So I'm so grateful to her. And um, here's the poem. After Tulip Heart. A pencil scrawled name beneath this sturdy desk fastens your dreams long-term to straight stemmed firs and lupin seeds let loose when fires force renewal and upheaval arrives as expected in 1939, despite war rustling the dying sky, this stranger built tin drawers, paper sized, a plywood top to hold unfilled forms, coffee mugs, chewed pens, a keyboard now, a modem spinning lights and bites he never imagined. This line looped could draw us together to the watery truth, columbine red cedar scent and river noise. Does he hear it too and hammer a world louder than thunder, loud enough to wake what's right in your whirlwind heart? Wow. So Sarah, when you listen to that, to Anna Maria's golden shovel of your poem, what were you thinking? It's just thrilling. I mean, it's really, I, I think it, I think for anybody who wants to do one of these, I would say if, if you do this on the poem of a living poet, find that poet and send it to them because oh, it really, yeah. One, I mean, one other rule about it that we've both broken that I've read of recently is that it should be either a poem, it should be a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, <laughs> which neither one of us is, and it should be a poem by an African American poet, which neither one of us is. So, so we're completely like, we should probably make up some different name for, for what we're doing. But I think it's a beautiful uh, homage to a poet and an acknowledgement of how their language can influence your own language and can can send your mind off into other directions that are unexpected and, and delightful. And yeah. Anna Maria, how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's, a, it's such an honor to, to hear your words reshaped in such, a, in such a, a new way. And that's part of what I love about poetry is the newness, this little shiver you get when you think, I never, never thought of the world that way. I never heard, and to hear your own words in a different mm -hmm. way. And yeah. I feel like um, for me, it was just like, the gift of when I read, when I read to the part every time, when I get to the whirlwind at the end, I just feel this little bubble, you know, this little bubble of excitement. And then to get to use that word um, in, in a poem that I wrote. So, so it felt like this little gift, you know, you, like, you know, when you carry the eggs in a spoon and in a <laughs> it's like little baby. It is. Don't break it. Don't break it. It's a fancy little word. So uh, it's and thrilling on both ends, I think. And that, that whirlwind originally was from, the Tulip Heart is a golden shovel on- um, Oh, it is. A, yeah, it's on a line from Gwendolyn Brooks, Second Sermon on the Warfland. And, and so all the end lines in Tulip Heart are a line of Gwendolyn Brooks. So whirlwind was a Gwendolyn Brooks word choice that passed through me to Anna Maria. And I, I just love that, that passing the words from one person to another. It's just beautiful. I'm so glad you shared that. I had never heard of the Golden Shovel before. So I definitely learned something today and I'm just really honored that you both took that on to share with us. Um, so I've had the amazing opportunity to watch Anna Maria's writing career blossom for many, many years and have had the great fortune to read many of her books. And Anna Maria, I was wondering if you could share with aspiring writers who are joining us today, some of your thoughts about your own journey and maybe some inspiration for them. I, I just think that, um, what I, I, that it's all about being willing to take a risk, really, like to throw yourself out a little further 
than you have before to use a different word, to um, take on a topic that seems too big, to, to go someplace that just feels scary. Um, and I think that uh, poetry in particular, if, you, if you're a poet, if you want to try poem, that they can take you to that risky place um, and, and um, allow you to reshape your thinking in ways that our logical prose shaped topic sentence thesis statement world doesn't always leave open to you. So, um, so first I would say anybody who wants to write should try poetry and not be scared like I was for 40 plus years. <laughs> um, but also that if you are writing poems, don't be scared to fool with them and, and you know, turn them around. I had a wonderful mentor, um, Carol Ann Davis, who taught me that when my, my poem started to get too narrative, to take the last line and make it the first line, like turn it upside down, just completely backwards, put the lines in opposite order. And there was all new meaning and excitement that came from that. So um, I guess my, my advice in one word is, is risk, take a risk. And how about you, Sarah? Yeah, I think, I think the same thing um, in, in, that, in that sense and also in the wider sense that for your writing in general, uh, to be willing to try anything and to not feel like you have to be pigeonholed as a fiction writer or a creative nonfiction or poet. That, that kind of pigeonholing, I think it's a fairly recent event in, in the writing world. And I, I think that previously writers maybe felt um, maybe felt more free to try different forms or different genres. And, you know, over, hopefully you have a long writing life and over the course of all those years, you may find yourself drawn to a different form or a different format. And, and depending on what you're writing about may demand a different format. So, uh, like, like getting back to the question of um, the climate catastrophe, that one of my poems in Taken is very directly about climate catastrophe in a way that I have never been able to write about it because as we, as we were talking about earlier, it's such a huge overwhelming topic. Somehow that, it, somehow it resists being written about in fiction or creative nonfiction by me. And and so it's a matter of being open and willing to, to use different forms and to just keep at it. You just, you're not gonna write anything unless you write. And I know that you have both been coaches for writers. Could you talk about the importance of having either a mentor or an editor um, for any type of writing, whether it's poetry or, you know, nonfiction or fiction. I think that's such an important opportunity. There's so many amazing writing retreats and, and groups that um, like Hugo House, for instance, here in Seattle. Are there others that you would recommend to people? And um, tell us a little bit about that. You want to go, Sarah? Take it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's it's really important in in everything to have mentors, and you know to have a a gardening mentor if you get into gardening, <laughs> a bird watching mentor if you get into bird watching, but definitely I think that I think we kind of find each other in in addition to you know the wonderful benefit of being in a in, like in an MFA program or taking a course somewhere where you have that teacher who is just focused so directly on your own work that that's an incredible experience. Um, but in addition, I think that, that just like with friends, we find each other, we find our mentors and we find the people who we want to mentor. And I know that remaining friends with some of my former students has been one of the great blessings of living as long as I have that it, to feel like oh, I can really, I can keep mentoring this person who's 20, 30 years younger than I am, even outside of the confines of, a, of an academic or a professional program. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All all of that give and take of the mentor mentee relationship and how it oscillates back and forth is is part of the magic. Um, but I, I mean, I think it it would be um, disingenuous not to speak to how how lonely writing can be. You most mm -hmm. of the time you are sitting in a chair by yourself um, and, and and stewing through your ideas, and it, and it can be um, not only lonely but discouraging to be alone like that. And so. Part of it is just reaching out and finding others who are in that same boat who can relate to the experience, um, mentors who can talk about ways to get through that experience, and friends who can just laugh with you and talk about something. You know, Sarah and I are both writers, and it's a huge part of our life. And when we're together, sometimes we don't talk about writing at all. Right? <laughs> Which might be a nice that. relief, right? We'll a little break, break from that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, we certainly don't talk to each other while we're writing. No, <laughs> that, that, that's the, and I think you're making a really good point that that unless you make an effort at creating or becoming part of a writing community, that it, it you're just going to be stuck all alone at your desk in your head, you know, with your little blinders on, and it's it's so in a way it's tempting to do that, and and it's necessary, you know, you have to have acres of time uninterrupted all alone but then you also need the antidote to that and so with that um, one of the questions um, from natalia is i'm an avid reader and don't read poetry who should i start with after reading both of your books i'd love to know sarah and anna maria if you could share with us maybe your top two or three poets that have inspired you that is, that is an impossible question because they change every <laughs> single day. But, um, but I, I really adore the work of Ross Gay. Ross Gay um, is, a, is an African-American poet from Indiana. And you can also, if you want to get into poetry by hearing it, which is, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's made for the music of words, um, you can search online for Ross Gay and you can hear him reading his poem with musical background, many of his poems. Wonderful. Um, Sorrow is not my name is one I would recommend uh, just Googling and checking out. Um, I'm also a huge fan of, of the poet, poet Ellen Bass. And mm -hmm. I will speak that Ellen Bass is also a fantastic teacher and a little plug for her. She gives online classes in poetry writing that are somehow amazingly equally good for beginners and for very advanced writers. So I'm going to go with Ross Gay and Ellen Bass. I'm curious who you'll go with, Sarah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've, I've got to echo both of those. And, um, and I'll give a plug for Eloise Klein Healy, aforementioned, who wrote the blurb for my book. Not, I'm not plugging her because she wrote the blurb for my book. <laughs> but she, I think that she's good for when you're starting to read poetry because she's very accessible. She writes about just normal, everyday, recognizable things. One time I was in a poetry class with her and she said, we were critiquing somebody's poem that was really abstract and nobody knew what it was about and nobody could understand it. And she said, just give me a shoe. I just want a person wearing a shoe and then I'll know what's happening. <laughs> so I think to start with poetry like that, that's kind of concrete and um, at least superficially understandable, even though there's a lot more going on underneath that. And uh, I would also say Jericho Brown is another current favorite of mine. And it's just too hard to, to think of. But, oh, here's, here's something. Poem A Day, which is produced by the Academy of American Poets. And if you go to poets.org, it's a free service where they'll send you a poem. They'll email you a poem every day. And they range from being ancient poetry all the all the way up to things that are being written right now today and that, that can be a great a way to idea. read a poem every day that is terrific i love that it's, it's so inspirational to get that in your box and and to expand your mind in ways that we haven't or i haven't done before i'm definitely going to do that um so we have a time for um a little question maybe that each of you would like to ask one another that you'd like to know. Um, so Anna Maria, do you wanna ask Sarah something that you've wanted to ask her for some time? 
Well, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna dive deep here. Um, we we sort of advertise this as a as a talk about secrets. So I, I really need to know this secret from Sarah um, about something we don't often talk about with writers, which is jealousy. Um, I know that Sarah has close personal friends who have been wildly successful and are much more famous than Sarah or me. And um, and I know that you're proud of that person. I am proud of every writer friend I have every time they have success. And yet in that moment, I also have this feeling like, how come that's not me? <laughs> and you seem to handle it with such, again, with such grace um, and generosity. And, and I just, I wanna know that secret and, and how that feels you know, inside and how, how you deal with that. Wow. Yeah, it's um, it is something that we don't we don't talk about very often as writers, and it does feel like it's kind of the a, a secret a secret life that we all have is comparing ourselves to other writers and often unfavorably. Um, and I have really struggled with it. And at one point, it, many years ago now, or at least several years ago, a friend of mine was just skyrocketing to fame and um and I felt very and I was I was teaching English as a second language at NYU and I remember going into it, reading something about her online her latest success and then kind of oh it's 11 o'clock I have to go teach my ESL class this is what I'm doing with my little stupid life and it really pained me for a couple of years what helped me get through it was, for one thing, I was able to talk to this friend of mine about it. And she was so open and even eager to talk to talk to someone about it because she had the experience that all of her friends were feeling all these things and nobody was expressing it. And I just went to her and I said, look, this sucks. I'm really happy for you, but this sucks. Um, but it's hard to reconcile that feeling of being genuinely excited and happy for your friend who's having all this great success mm -hmm. and at the same time feeling pained by it. Um, I think, you know, eventually, I don't, I don't know how I made that better for myself. Talking to her definitely helped and eventually her moment ended or receded and that wild fame you know, started to fade and somebody else ascended. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it seeing that cycle allowed me to see myself in that too, that I am not real famous. Probably I never will be real famous, but I, I'm really happy. I'm really happy with what I have. And And one thing the pandemic has taught me is that I am the most fortunate woman in the world and so wh what do I need to be on the cover of whatever magazine poets and writers you might say <laughs> Sarah that's so important and thank you so much for sharing that was really powerful and I do think that the pandemic has shown all of us that we are we have got so much to be thankful for and we don't need to be on the cover of Time Magazine or a poetry um, industry book or anything like that, that we can revel in our own right and in our own um, wisdom and thoughts. So thank you for sharing that. That was really powerful. And Sarah, do you have a question for Anna Maria that yeah. you always wanted to ask? This, this is maybe a little bit lighter. Um, I don't I don't have anything I've wanted to ask her for, uh, you know, that's been burning inside because I think I've asked her all those things. But um, the other night I was with some friends and the subject came up of, um, we we're talking about kind of how our families had injured us. And the subject came up of, so what good things did you get from your family? Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to know what, like, what qualities did you get from your family that, that particularly fed into your being a writer? Well, I feel like, I feel like all of them, really. <laughs> I mean, um, first of all, my, they, both of my parents loved language. My dad was, um, my dad who died when I was young, apparently was an English major and had always wanted to be a writer. So I think um, it really um, warms my mom to see me kind of fulfilling what he had always wanted to do. Uh, my mom, on the other hand, is, um, is a linguist. Like she taught Spanish language and literature for, for her career. And so that precision with language, 
I get from her. So I've got kind of the dreamy, big thinking dad and then mom with the precision of language. But I really think it's more than that. Um, both my parents were adventurers. They both left their homes and did huge things. They met in South America where I was born. Um, I try to picture my mom. She always likes to characterize herself as a good Catholic girl in St. Louis who never did anything exciting, except for when she was like 20 years old and got on the DC-3 and flew to Venezuela. Now, maybe that's something, you know, a little risky for that. So, um, yeah, so that kind of willingness, again, to take a risk and be adventuresome, and then also the, the love of language. I also can remember my maternal grandmother playing, boy, she could play a mean game of Scrabble, but you could not beat that woman. So, <laughs> Great inspiration, um, uh, Anna Maria. Thanks for sharing. So do you have another book that you guys are writing in the works? Is there anything in the works after this? Well, my, I, um, I have a, a second one. I guess this, I might as well announce that it has been accepted for publication next year. Um, and it's completely different. It's about um, Chinese miners along the Columbia River um, in the 1870s and, um, and more largely about xenophobia in our culture. So when I started talking about it, it was before the pandemic, before all the anti-Asian hate crimes. I mean, there have always been those, but since this resurgence um, and, and, and now to have that coming out in this moment is super exciting to me. So that will come out from Tory House next October. And I just learned that it, the book is called Pushed. Fantastic, Anne Marie. I'm so proud of you. That's so exciting. And what a timely um, topic for all of us. I'm looking forward to reading that. And how about you, Sarah? Um, I've got a couple of things. I've got I've got two novels now that are with my agent that she's looking for a publisher for. And then I'm I'm working on another book. And then I'm working on um, short stories in Spanish and English that started mm -hmm. as a project so that I, to help me learn Spanish. Um, so that, that is in process. <laughs> so inspiring, thank you. Well, and thank you so much, both of you for sharing your stories and your journey with us today. I have to say, I'm just so inspired. And um, as you know, we're going hiking right after this for our Friday hike. And I'm gonna be thinking about all of the inspiration that you both shared today. And um, I think I'm gonna take a stab at some um, uh, some poetry writing when I, this yeah. weekend I have a little time and I, mean, I have a month by myself next month. And so I think that that will be a time to go inward and think about the smaller things and taking a peek inside myself and see what comes out on the paper. So thank you for sharing. Before we leave, I wanna ask you a couple of rebel questions. Anna Maria, why don't you go first? Or Sarah, why don't you go first? And we're just gonna do a quick, quick little rapid fire here. So Sarah, what do you revel in? I revel in the natural world, especially the minutiae of it. The little teeny tiny butterflies and the little teeny tiny buds and that. Also the black bear. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully we won't see a black bear today or a brown bear for that matter. <laughs> but uh, Monica and I seem to bring in bear energy whenever we go hiking. So um, Sarah, who is the woman that inspires you and why? There are so many. It's so, so hard to choose. So I'm going to go with my mother because she was a photographer and she in the 1970s was able to persist despite several obstacles and create an artist's life for herself. I love that. What is the daily ritual you can't live without? I wouldn't say there's anything I can't live without, but exercise. I am a much better person to be around if I get some good, solid exercise every day. Agree. I walk every day or get outside, have to get outside. What would you say to your 25 year old self? Wow. Um, don't worry so much. Love that. Okay, Anna Maria, on to you. What do you revel in, Anna Maria? Well, I really, really wanted to just answer open water because it's swim season and I love to swim <laughs> in open water. And I love sharing that with Sarah as well. 
but I've also been newly back in New York here and I am always humbled and so moved by the kindness of others, the small kindnesses of others. I had to get my car jumped yesterday by a guy at a tire shop and he could not have been kinder. So I totally revel in the, in the small kindnesses of others. I love that. Who is a woman that inspires you and why? Uh, Shirley Chisholm, who uh, was the uh-huh. woman who, uh, the African-American woman who ran for president in 1972. Um, I've always admired her. And I had this fabulous dream about her when I was writing this book of poetry where she was dancing salsa, which is not in her character. I read all. that poem. I just <laughs> love that so yeah. much. I read that to Jordan the other night. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, I, she her, her slogan was unbought and unbossed. And man, whenever I'm down, I think about Shirley. Oh, I love that. Okay, what is a daily ritual you can't live without? <laughs> so... I get my first cup of coffee, and when I'm with Lori, we do this together, we take turns, and we take it back to bed, and then we read an actual real book, like no playing with your phone, and um, often it's poetry, but just reading in the morning with my cup of coffee quietly, usually with Lori, is is, um, what I really need. I love that ritual so much, and what would you say to your 25-year-old self? Don't worry, don't worry. No, I <laughs> also, I love, I, I was really late to learning anything about improv, but I had this wonderful friend who taught improv who would come to my writing classes. And when I learned the whole like, yes, and routine, like you, you take uh, what's given to you and you do yes, and, that's what I want to say to my 25 year old self, just yes, and just keep going. Thank you so much for playing with us. That was so fun. <laughs> and what a great way to end our conversation today. I can't read, wait to read all of your books. I've read several of your poems independently, but I can't wait to get those, those uh, books in my hand and here in Seattle. And I hope all of you do as well. Um, this will, um, you can order their books at amsandsva.org and they both have independent websites, which are linked in the email that I sent you all today. And with that, thank you again. I'm going to pass it off to Monica. Thanks, Joni. Um, Sarah, I saw that Spanish book sitting behind you. And so it made me wonder if you were trying to write poetry or something in Spanish. So I loved hearing that story. Um, Thank you both so much. I just loved hearing your work and perspective. I signed up for one poem a day for thanks. So thanks for that. And I just feel a lot more grounded and inspired this morning. So thank you both. Can you believe it's September next week? No. Uh, But we're kicking off the fall season with Seattle's most well-known restaurateur. She's joining us on September 13th with Joni for a cooking demo, um, Renee Erickson. And we'll also be taking a peek at her new cookbook. And for those of you who don't live in Seattle, Renee is an amazing James Beard award-winning chef and restaurateur. And then Joni and I are so grateful to one of our advisory board members, Monica Hunsberry, who will be kicking off a nurture series for us focusing on parenting. Uh, This first session will be with Christine Michelle Carter on September 17th on motherhood and business. Christine is a true powerhouse uh, working on behalf of parents and single mothers. She worked on maternal initiatives with Vice President Harris, and she's just a joy to listen to. And then on September 24th, we'll be talking with Suzanne Samard, author of Finding the Mother Tree. And I'm really excited about this. Suzanne's research area was the inspiration for James Cameron's movie, Avatar. She explores how trees communicate and it creates the question, at least for me, of how we are all connected in this world and universe. So it's such a special message. Um, All of this information is on our website and all of our planned events on um, rebel11.com. So we hope that we see you all soon. And thank you so much again for joining us this morning. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anne-Marie and Sarah. Have a great day. Take Take care. care. Thanks.